Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2022. I don't know about you, but I always love the start of a new year. I don't actually stay up till midnight myself anymore, but I love waking up in my New Year's house and looking at the new version of myself in the mirror, going outside, seeing the new trees in my new neighborhood. I haven't lost my mind. I'm just being facetious because nothing actually changes, right? What changes in the new year? Nothing changes. But we always flip the calendar, and that's our impetus to make changes in our lives, right? That's when we look to make ourselves differently. Governments set new legislative agendas, businesses set new corporate goals, and on an individual level, we set New Year's resolutions. So I'm kind of curious to know, I'd love to see a show of hands, how many people have New Year's resolutions this year already? Wow, not many. Okay. Keep your hands up if they're still going strong on January 2nd. Okay, that's good. One day down. Just a few more to go. I used to, that was like a big question when I come in the office after the new year. I'd ask, do you have any resolutions? There's this one guy I always worked with, and with a very straight face, he would just say, yeah, get even. And that was it. <laughs> I, it was a little unsettling. I, I like to think he was joking, but I never really followed up. It was kind of a com- conversation ender at that point. So if you do like to make resolutions, you're not alone. According to a recent survey by Statista.com, approximately 43% of surveyed individuals are setting at least one resolution for 2022. The top five resolutions for this year, according to them, are as follows. Number five, spend less time on social media. Number four, spend more time with family. Number three, make a career change. That's a pretty big one. Number two, save money. And number one, lose weight or exercise more. Now, that list is specific to 2022, but if you go back and you look at other years, they're actually pretty similar from year to year. They don't change a lot. And one thing you'll notice about these things is most of these are pretty hard tasks, right? I mean, losing weight is hard. Consistent exercise plans are hard. Career change is very, very hard things. And the other thing about these are these things, you have to do them essentially all by yourself, too, if you think about it. I mean, sure, you can join a gym and you can hire a personal trainer, but when it's time to get up on that treadmill, it's pretty much just you getting up there, right? You can't tag out and have someone run those miles for you. And if you're going through uh, a change in your diet, I mean, you can hire a dietitian to help you plan out healthy meals, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's got to eat the broccoli instead of the french fries, right? You've got to do it yourself. If you're making a career change, you might hire a recruiter, but you're the one taking that personal risk to go out and switch jobs. And so you may not be surprised, even though there's 43% of people that take on resolutions, only 8% of those people typically finish the year with success because it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of work that falls on our shoulders. And even the, the start of a new calendar to give us motivation isn't always enough to get us through. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you. Um, I hope you make your resolutions. But what I do want to say is as we think about our future glory and we think about what God wants of us in 2022, there's two good things we can take away from today's passage. Number one, that the things that God has called us to is not that difficult. And two, that we don't have to do it alone. What we're actually going to see in this passage is God is actively guiding us along the way. And so our passage today, as Chad read, will be Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30, and it's the second part of a two-part series we're looking at with uh, a passage written by Paul to reassure us and give us hope that while we struggle here on earth, we have glory to look forward to as followers of Christ. Okay, so last week, Deepak led us through verses 18 through 25 and this idea of groaning to glory, and we saw that our own sufferings And our own struggles are not something we endure alone, but all of creation is groaning along with us. All of creation is broken. All of creation is corrupted by sin. And we all suffer this brokenness together, waiting the return of the Creator. And we who have died to our old selves and are born again in Christ as such, if that were birth, we are set apart from the world. We are now children of the kingdom of God and not children of, of this world. And so we groan inwardly as we struggle with renewed hearts against the desires of this world while we wait for the redemption of our bodies, free from sin and free from corruption. And we did the year 2021 reflecting on that struggle and Paul's reassurance and encouragement to endure. But as we start a new year, let's look forward to the good news, the second half of this passage, that while we are groaning to glory, we also have God's complete and total control of the situation to rely upon. And even though it seems at times 
that we may be struggling without purpose or without help, what we're going to find is that we are actually guided by God to glory. So let's start in verse 26. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So creation is groaning. We are groaning. And now we see the Holy Spirit is groaning. And Deepak mentioned this last week, but groaning is not whining, right? Groaning is not complaining. Complaining, it's not sighing. Groaning is this sound you make as a response to physical pain or pressure, intense pain or pressure. Think about like a weightlifter getting ready to deadlift this 500-pound weight and just struggling, making the sound from the pain and the pressure of lifting the weight. That is what groaning is. We are all groaning in our struggles in this broken world, groaning because we desire to be free from the pain and difficulties we face. And now we see that God the Spirit is groaning along with us in prayer for our behalf. But let's back up a bit and look a little deeper. Why is the Spirit doing this? Well, let's go back. When Jesus left the disciples after his resurrection and ascended to heaven to return to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he sits today, he asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit as a helper to us. John 14, 6, Jesus tells the disciples, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And the coming of the Holy Spirit is actually, it's no small thing. In, in John 16, Jesus tells us it's actually to our advantage that Jesus leave us and return to heaven and the Spirit come to us. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And then when we see in Acts 2, chapter, one, or chapter 2, verse 1, we see this happening. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So going back to our verse, what we see in Romans 8 is that as we endure sufferings today, that God and the person of the Holy Spirit dwells within us and is there helping us to pray by interceding with groanings too deep for words and we don't even know what to pray for. Do you ever feel like you don't know what to pray for? Maybe you know there's something wrong in your life, but you don't really know what it is. Maybe you don't know what God's will for your life is. Maybe you don't even know what you need at that given time. Should I pray for strength and endurance? Or should I pray for peace or a specific thing? Or do I just need this taken away right now? Sometimes we don't even know. Paul is telling us when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf to pray for the thing we really need, even if we don't even know what we really need. And he does it in a way that transcends language. If you're like me, you tend to get caught up in your words sometimes, trying to say things correctly in your prayers, but this verse says it doesn't matter. All we need to do is make the effort to pray, and God, t- God, and God takes it from there. God the Spirit is praying on your behalf for you personally to God the Father in a way that doesn't even need words. Isn't that a relief? I would hate to think my prayers might be hindered by my own lack of full understanding of God or my lack of full understanding of my own life situation. Paul says that's not the case. We reach out to God in prayer with a heart of seeking Him, and He takes it from there. It kind of reminds me of my fifth grade science fair. I don't know if they still do science fairs anymore, but in my day, The science fair was an opportunity for you to show the whole world, or at least your fellow classmates, the extreme depth of scientific knowledge and understanding that one of your parents has. I mean, it was supposed to be a student project, but it seemed to be an unwritten rule that somebody's parent is doing it for them. And in my case, my dad was an electrical engineer. And so for my science fair project, we built a galvanometer and a Wheatstone bridge entirely from scratch using a compass, some wiring, a battery, and some miscellaneous electrical parts. And as all of you already know, a galvanometer is a device for measuring electrical uh, current and resistance in a circuit, rather. And so we didn't just stop at building it. We tested it against a series of circuits and verified the data. And we did all of this not because I'm a child prodigy, but because my dad is a licensed engineer, and he did all the work for me, basically. I mean, I showed up. I learned a lot. I explained it all to the judges. But if I'm being completely honest, my dad's the one who won first prize in the Cedar Hill Middle School Science Fair that year, not me. Likewise, when followers of Christ pray, God does all the work for us. 
And so because of that, we should not be discouraged to pray for things because we won't say something the right way or because we don't know what we should ask for. In fact, shouldn't we be more encouraged to pray so the Spirit will intercede for us more on our behalf? And so if we're looking for resolutions to make for 2022, I'd start with one. We should pray more. Pray more with the knowledge we don't even have to get the words right for it to be effective. Pray continuously. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us pray without ceasing. Pray not just for the things you need, but for the needs of others. Pray a prayer of thankfulness for the needs that have been met by God. Pray for wisdom to handle things in a Christ-like way. Pray from the feelings of your heart with the knowledge that the Spirit will intercede on your behalf with specifics in a way that transcends language and will perfectly align with the will of God the Father. Verse 27 continues saying, and he who searches hearts knows what the mind what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So God the Spirit is dwelling within you, knows your heart, knows your struggles, knows everything that you need, but also God the Spirit knows the depth of God and knows the Father's will for your life and knows how to communicate back and forth. Look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 2.10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So the Holy Spirit is not just relaying our prayer needs for us. He's interceding on our behalf, communicating our needs to the Father, but also helping us understand God. Now, this doesn't mean we receive special revelations from the Spirit in the form of dreams or visions, but what it does mean, we don't need those, by the way, because we have the Bible. The Bible is the final revelation of God. But what it does mean is that we can understand and spiritually discern the truths found in Scripture from the work of the Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The Holy Spirit then intercedes on our behalf in our prayers, but we must first seek God in prayer for him to do so. The Spirit also intercedes on our behalf, helping us understand and discern the Word of God, but first we must read the Word of God for him to do so. And when we do, the Spirit helps us understand what we're reading, the spiritual truth, and without that understanding, it's folly. It doesn't make sense. We don't understand it. But with the Spirit's work, we're able to understand and discern, and we're able to apply it. And so if we're looking for another resolution for 2022, I might recommend that we seek God further by reading reading the Word of God more. And do so knowing that the Spirit will guide our understanding when we do. If you've ever desired for God to speak to you, understand that God speaks to you through His Word. We read to be guided by God because the Bible is sufficient for equipping us for every good work. Hebrews 7.25 tells us, Christ is able to to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And our verse tells us the Spirit is interceding for the saints according to the will of the Father. So if you think about it, God the Son is interceding in heaven for those who seek him, who abide in him. And God the Spirit is interceding in earth for those who abide in the Son within us. And so as we're groaning in our struggles, as we're, as we're having these difficulties of the world, we're being guided by God to glory, interceding on our behalf in a big way. We aren't stuck in our despair without hope. We're growing through our struggles with God, guiding us along and helping us as we need help along the way. So we are never alone, never without God's guidance. Now the next verse, verse 28, is one of the verses I think is one of the most misunderstood verses in the New Testament in my opinion. Verse 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I think where confusion happens on this verse is with the word good. All things work together for good. Good in this sense doesn't mean good like tacos are good or that an empty seat next to you on a long flight is good. Those things are good. But the context of this verse is good in the eyes of God. And sometimes what's good in God's eyes isn't necessarily something we would call good necessarily. The Greek word for good used here is agathon. It's also the word used in Mark 10, 18 when Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. It's also the word used in Matthew 7, 17 when Jesus says, every good tree bears good fruit. 
So a hackathon has a usage that conveys this meaning of moral goodness and not just preferential goodness. And so what this verse is telling us is that for those who love God, all things work together for our own good or for our own sanctification. And what it doesn't mean is that it'll always seem good to us at the time. In fact, sometimes what God is actively working together for our own good may be extremely difficult or painful to go through. Remember last week, Deepak taught us in the first part of this passage that our present sufferings are not comparable to the future glory we have to look forward to. This is telling us that our own sacrifices are actually being used right now by God for our own sanctification, that God takes all things, even those things which we may see as bad, and uses them for our growth, for a greater purpose. And we'll see what that greater purpose here is in the next verse. But first, look what Jesus says in John 15 too. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. The branch that bears fruit is the believer, who is connected to the true vine, which is Christ. And our good fruit is our good works that we have through our connection to the work of the Spirit. But pruning, the Father will occasionally prune, even though we're producing good fruit, the Father will prune the branches. And pruning is the act of cutting back. Pruning is painful. Pruning is hard. Pruning is getting cut back and then having to grow forward all over again. But also, pruning is necessary to get the branch to grow. It's necessary for the health of the tree. And this is a pretty difficult challenge, I think, for us as Christians to understand that even our own worst suffering is being used by God for our greater good. It's especially hard to see when that suffering is big, when it involves deep pain or sacrifice when it involves death of a loved one. It's hard to see any good in those times, and yet God is active in all of those times, working within these events. It's hard to understand this idea. I tend to think about our own parent-child relationships when I try to think about God caring for his children. And as an example, when I was a young child, I had asthma. I don't have it anymore, but when I was a kid, when I would have an attack, I'd get this deep burning sensation in my chest as my airways were constricting. And it would just feel like burning, but I would start wheezing when I breathed. And that was my cue to my parents to take me to the doctor to get treated because they could hear me wheezing as I breathed. And they would take me to the doctor, and the treatment was always the same. It was a shot in the arm of adrenaline, sometimes two, occasionally three. And as the six-year-old version of me, that was like the worst possible outcome, right? The shot in the arm. I couldn't imagine anything worse than that. It was terrible. It hurt. The burning sensation in my lungs seemed like a minor discomfort. The shot was the terrible thing. But my parents knew better than I did. They knew that if left untreated, a severe enough attack would close my airways altogether and I wouldn't be able to breathe at all. And so that painful moment of that shot was for my good. But I never saw that. If it was left up to me, I would never go to the doctor. I'd just stay home. I saw it as capricious. It's almost like it was a punishment. Like I didn't have any meaning. It was just painful. It just hurt. I didn't see any good in it. Why must we as Christians endure such difficulties and struggles? Well, verse 29 tells us, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. There it is. There's the reason why. That's the, this is the greater purpose. We are being sanctified so that we may be conformed to the image of Christ. We are being saved by grace of God through the death and resurrection of the Son, that by faith in Him we are made righteous. But it's not our righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness that we wear. It's not a result of any of our works. And then our sanctification then is post-salvation. After we are saved, we are slowly being transformed into this image of Christ, obedient to the Father, sacrificing Himself out of His love for others, doing good works constantly, resisting sin fully. And if we think about it, this should make sense to us, right? Would any of us really expect to be changed by living a life of comfort and ease? Would that cause us to be conformed to the image of God? 1 Peter 2.20 tells us this, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. In chapter 4, verse 12, it continues this idea. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, 
that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become the ungodly and the sinner? Now watch this. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We are to endure suffering patiently, faithfully, and do so with the knowledge and understanding that it is actually for our own good, for our own growth, that we may be conformed to the image of Christ that we may become heirs with Christ. Verse 29 uses the phrase brothers, but last week we looked at verse 17, which read, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Now, just to be clear, these verses are not telling us that we are to become like God ourselves. Instead, we are to be adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. And as God's family, we will benefit We will share in the benefits of being a member of the family. We will live eternally in the presence of God, experience the glory of God, receive new bodies free from decay, live in a world free from decay and sin. That's the glory we are being guided to. Verse 29 and 30 conclude our passage with this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So let's start with foreknew. Foreknew in this case does not just mean that God knows all things. He does. But it doesn't mean that he knew that we would come to Christ on our own, eventually of our own doing. It says that what it means is that he knew us before we were born, before creation, and decided of his own will and his own reasoning to have a relationship with us. It means he knew us and selected us. We know this because of the pairing of the words foreknew and predestined. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. God selected us and predestined us, not due to anything we had done, we hadn't even been born, or because of anything we would do at any point in the future, but of his own will and for reasons of his own choosing. Now, I know that's a difficult concept sometimes to get your head around, but it's not one that's silent at all in the Bible. Ephesians 1.4 tells us, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Jesus says in John 6.44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is known as the effectual call by God. And that's the next step in verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Now, if you struggle with the idea that God doesn't predestine some people, and you find it easier to accept the fact that people are willfully rejecting God, understand that both statements are true. God does not predestine some people. And also, some people, those people willingly reject God, freely do so. The doctrine of election is a mystery of God we can't fully understand the depth of, but what I want to convey in this verse this morning is that for those of you, those of you here who are followers of Christ, you were chosen by God for a great purpose, and he is, you were loved by God, and he is working all things for your own good. Those whom God has foreknown and predestined are called by God to receive the gospel. They will be drawn from God out of their state of rebellion, and they will turn back from that life of rebellion and turn toward Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, Paul tells the church, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The gospel is folly to those who haven't been called to receive it, just as the word of God is folly to those who are unable to discern it. But those who have been called by God to hear, it is the power of salvation. We are called by God, and we hear the call, and we respond to it. Verse 30 continues, and those whom he called, he also justified. Our justification, of course, is our change in status from being guilty of sinning against God to being holy and righteous in his sight. And again, this is not of our own actions. It's not even our own righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness imparted to us through his death and resurrection on our behalf. 
But this is the, the part to, to think about, the part to focus on. God not only knows us before we are created, but predestines us for salvation. He then sends His Son as a propitiation for our guilt so we may be declared righteous simply by accepting His death as our ransom. So when the verse says, those whom He called, He also justifies, it's not saying God is overlooking our sin. It's saying God is taking this big step to put into action the plan by which our sin may be imputed instead to His Son who is without sin. And He does this for us on our behalf. Each step of this process is God completing a huge work to guide us along to glory. Selecting us, predestining us, calling us, justifying us. Finally, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I think it's interesting here that Paul uses the past tense glorified. He pre knew us and predestined us before creation in the distant past. He sent his son to redeem us as justified in the past. He calls us while we are still alive, but glorification doesn't happen until Christ returns. But Paul says God glorified us, past tense, and he does this to emphasize the certainty of God's promise to us. God has promised us glorification in Christ, and because he's predestined us and called us and justified us, our glorification is certain. It's not up to chance. God will complete that which he has started in each one of us. In fact, Philippians 1.6 tells us, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In John 6.38, Jesus tells us, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. It is the will of the Father that the Son shall not lose a single person who has been called to him. Our glorification is certain. It's decided. And as Deepak mentioned last week, it's a joy that's greater than we can even imagine. We can't even anticipate it. And so as we prepare for the coming year, 2022, I think one final resolution we could pull from our text is to rejoice more. And not just more, but always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's pretty much a guarantee we will face some struggles in 2022. But even in those struggles, God is working all things for our good, for our growth, for the purpose of growing us closer to the image of his son. And in doing so, he is present and fully active in our lives. He's predestined us for glory. God the Son, God the Father predestines us for glory. God the Son lays down his life and takes it up again so that all who call upon his name would be saved. And God the Spirit is indwelling us, interceding on our behalf to pray and to guide us and grow us in our sanctification. And God's involvement in our lives should give us reason to be joyful, should be give us reason to have hope in times of difficulty. James tells us, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. How do we do that? We do that because we are being guided by God to glory. We're not struggling without purpose. We are growing for our own good. And it should cause us to seek that which is good and pleasing to God. It should not cause us to focus on our own misery. It should cause us to walk in the good works he's prepared for us. To let our light shine before others so they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. Philippians 2.12 sums us up perfectly. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As followers of Christ, we are being guided by God to glory, and our focus should be to seek God in prayer, to gain understanding of him through his word, and to rejoice in his love, his immeasurable love for us always, because in all of our trials, he is guiding us to our own good. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for this comfort in your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your involvement in our lives. Thank you for giving the wisdom, giving us the wisdom of knowing um, how you work in our lives. Lord, thank you for, for knowing us, for predestining us, for calling us to you, for justifying us, and for guiding us to glory. 
Lord, this has been a difficult year for many of us. We've had so many struggles individually and as a church with sickness, with health issues. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Lord, I, I pray, for, uh, pray for your guidance this year for our church and for all who suffer, um, that you may give us wisdom to seek you during these times and to respond in a way that gives you glory. Lord, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.